And the politicians loved it. These Democrats that took over the Congress, they said, we'll save you. Sure, come on in, let's talk. <laughs> so in three months time in the congressional session in the spring of 1933, there's a huge outpouring of legislation was enacted. Uh, a great deal of it, the sort of laws you could describe as bailouts of some kind. Uh, and odd kinds of bailouts in a way because this was all done ad hoc. See, it's, uh, some conservatives look at the New Deal and they say, you know, it's like this leftist conspiracy. These people wanted to turn the country into some kind of socialism. No way. They, they did all this piece by piece. They didn't have a grand plan because they didn't know what they were doing. A bunch of farmers came in with their lobbyists and they, they, they talked to the officials in the Roosevelt administration, they talked to leaders in Congress, they said, look, we, we need some help, we need to get these prices back up. And you know, we can do this if we could just enforce a cartel agreement here in, in wheat and corn and soybeans and what have you. Uh, otherwise, you know, we can't get all these farmers organized, they won't, they won't fall in line, you know, everybody cheats when we try to suppress supply. So. Manufacturers were coming in singing the same song. Everybody's saying, look, if we can only get our prices back up, after all, prices had fallen in the wholesale prices by about 30% by 1933. And so all these businessmen, very naturally, are looking around and say, Man, I'm having so much trouble here. I'm losing money because the price is so low for my product. Well, yeah. Other things equal, if people had been able to sell their output at a higher price, they would have been in better shape. But they all understood that the way you can make the price go up in any industry, you know, if you read Alfred Marshall, you knew that if you restrict supply, the price will be higher in that market. So they all wanted to restrict supply, and the government said, okay, let's do that. Here's a way we'll do it in agriculture. And they had a complex Agricultural Adjustment Act in 1933. It had eight different ways to bail out farmers. Uh, but most of them boiled down to supply restrictions enforced by the government in some way. And uh, for industry, they just outright went out and cartelized the whole in industry of the United States. Over 700 specific industries were organized. They were, they were told in the language of the legislation that they were authorized to form codes of fair competition, which meant, of course, they're authorized to form cartels, which would be enforced by the government. I've got, a, I call this Higgs' first law of, of statute naming. <laughs> Whatever the government calls its law, the law is actually the opposite of that. Right? So it's a recovery <laughs> act, it's actually a, a make the depression worse act. You know? If it's a competition act, it's a suppress competition act and so forth, you know, try that. See if it doesn't work for you. <laughs> Works for me. Uh, so, so we cartelized the whole economy. Think of that. We had to suspend the antitrust laws that had been, been there for 40 years plus because they said you can't do this, it's anti-competitive. So the, those got trashed for the time being. And so all these industries are, are either forming these cartel arrangements of their own or they're or the government is threatening them. Look, if you don't do it, we're gonna do it for you. And so they had this, this blanket code where they would just go out and impose on the industry some kind of a cartel arrangement. And they took many different forms. You know, They took forms about making people report prices before they change them, controlling the number of hours you could have workers on the job, uh, Con controlling uh, the quality specifications, not allowing people to, to alter the, 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 the sort of specifications of products without notice. All these ways, were ways of undercutting real competition, you know, making it impossible for anybody to get the jump on rivals the way they normally do if they can. Yes, sir. Bob, as a result of Milton Friedman Day yesterday, I learned just enough about his view of the Great Depression to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, he uh, attributed, at least in part, to the Federal Reserve not uh, lending out enough money. 
Yes. Uh, what's your take on that? What's history's take on it? And did he himself disavow this uh, before his No, book? Milton never disavowed that idea, nor did Anna Schwartz, his co-author. Uh, Anna just died recently, uh, rest her soul, a great, great economic historian. Um, and no, they, they believe that to their dying days. And uh, a lot of people believe that now. Ben Bernanke, for example, he claims that what he's doing now is based on the fact that he's not going to repeat the error the Fed made in the early 1930s when it did not pump up the money supply enough to prevent all those bank failures. <coughs> and it had all these dire repercussions for the economy. I, uh, my view is that, first of all, you don't want to think about the economy in that aggregative way. That makes it look as if the whole economy's ups and downs are driven by one thing, changes in the money stock. And that's the kind of mistake I started out this talk by warning you, don't make that mistake. So Milton was a great economist in many ways, but, but it, it, it may be that he actually uh, obeys Rothbard's law of specialization. Murray used to say that uh, uh, every economist specializes in the thing he's worst at. Okay? <laughs> so Milton was a specialist in monetary economics. He was great on all kinds of things in economics. You know, he was great on subsidies and regulations and you name it. But it may have been his, his monetary theory was his worst, worst thing. Uh, I, I, I do think that the Fed could have taken some actions that would have helped to prevent some of those bank failures. But I don't think it could have prevented very many of them, partly for the reason I explained. Unit banking system was, was, was already doomed in those circumstances. So it didn't matter how much the Fed pumped up bank reserves. The, the Bank of Helena was going under. Okay, and that was just going to happen. And so, you know, banks all over the South that, you know, were tied into these cotton farmers. And, and when cotton fell out, uh, the price fell very low. That was that, you know, the Bank of Tuscaloosa was cooked. So uh, this happened all over the country. The Fed couldn't have prevented it. Uh, there weren't a lot of big banks that failed in the early 30s. Most of the bigger banks came through uh, the Great Depression. It was mostly these small and middle-sized banks that didn't, didn't make it. So uh, yes and no, I, I agree a little bit with Milton about that, but I, I would tell a much bigger, more complex story because I, I, I am sure that given the perfect storm of bad policies, okay, no matter what kind of monetary policy you have, with all these other bad New Deal policies, you were going to have a terrible depression. Because the government had never assaulted the market system like that ever before. And so the results were faded. You know, there was no way to manipulate money and avoid it. So uh, I'm a great admirer of Milton Friedman. I think he was, he was certainly one of the persons who did the most to keep the idea of economic freedom alive in this country during some very dark days uh, for those of us who, who believe in it, but uh, not wholly in accord with his monetary interpretations. Okay, well, what do we have lately here? We, we got a lot of similar things. Uh, only this time, you see, we, we had Bernanke running the Fed, so to avoid those perceived mistakes of the early 30s, the Fed has taken actions so unprecedented, they're almost unbelievable. Uh, almost unbelievable. <laughs> Let's see if I got something here I can show you. Yeah, that's it. The Fed controls the monetary base, okay? The amount of currency and, and commercial bank reserves at Federal Reserve Banks. That's the monetary base because it's on, on that basis that banks make loans and, and set up checking accounts for people and expand the money supply in the sense of media, media of exchange. Okay? People don't, don't spend the, <coughs> the bank reserves at the Fed, which is the bulk of the monetary base. 
but they do spend the money created by the commercial banking system on the basis of that. Look what happens to it. Here, here, here we've had it uh, going along for, for half a century, just about as steady as you could ever see anything in an economy like ours. It's just like, you know, you can put this thing on cruise control. <laughs> Every year it's like that. And now look here. Starting in the fall of 2008, this thing takes off like an ICBM at Cape Canaveral. You know? uh, zoom! It goes almost straight up. And it goes up so far, it more than doubles. You double the monetary base of this country in a year's time? There's, there's not a living economist who ever imagined that would occur. Not one. I certainly would nev never have dreamed of anything one-tenth that big. And yet there it is. These are the Fed's own data. <laughs> I didn't make it up. It's their graph. Don't blame me. <laughs> so, and, and we're stuck up there now. Except that now, what's in the news? A pressure on Bernanke to, 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 to go more in this direction. It's like, what he did here didn't have much noticeable effect. You see, I've already showed you the employment data and other things like that. So, so it, it, didn't, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So what do you do if you try an experiment and it fails? You do it again, only you, you know, pour more ingredients into it this time. That's the thinking here. Because that is actually the thinking of, of Friedman and company. That's what they said about the 1930s. Actually, the Fed in the early 1930s increased the monetary base. Some. It didn't go down. It went up. But it was offset by the fact that the, the, that the banks themselves wanted to hold more reserves rather than lend them, and by the fact that the public wanted to hold more cash rather than demand deposits in the banks. And so the money multiplier fell, and the, the Fed, you know, had done what the monitors say it should do, but it didn't work because the public didn't cooperate and the banks didn't cooperate. Yes, sir? Interestingly enough, what he did, of course, is, is, uh, is he, gave, he gave somebody some caffeine and he gave them a depressant at the same time because the velocity collapsed. Yes. And the way the velocity collapsed is because he then bribed the banks, changing the rules after a year, saying, tell you what, don't lend any of that money. Put it back in, in, my, in my bank and I'll pay you interest on it. And so the banks aren't lending the money. I mean, obviously, you know, triple the money supply, you should see gas when it's coming out of it, you know, that one. Yeah, he, well, uh, he did and he didn't, you see. I mean, it's true that they changed the rules right there in the fall of 2008, at the very time they started this nonsense, uh, to allow the Fed to pay interest to commercial banks. And before that, they didn't get any interest at all. So that's why they didn't want to have any excess reserves, because they earned nothing on them. They wanted to lend them out. But <clears throat> what's happened now is that they get, they get one quarter of 1%. Interest and you know, when inflation's at least a couple of percent, that's like they get nothing. They they get penalized for holding those reserves, and yet they hold them anyhow. They lose real value on on uh, excess reserves. This is the total monetary base, but if I show you the amount of reserves in excess of legally required amounts, you'd find that that it's between 1.5 and 2 trillion dollars right now. And the banks are earning negative real rates of return on those reserves. So the question is, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing it for the same reason that the people who greatly increase their demand to hold cash are holding cash because they're afraid. They're afraid. What are they going to do? What kind of loans are they going to make? They're afraid if they do lend the money, it's going to end up being a bad loan. And so they're, they're cutting their losses by holding this gigantic, unthinkable amount of excess reserves. Now, this really is unprecedented. I said a few minutes ago, we've seen almost everything before in economic history. We have never seen anything like this, ever. Totally unprecedented. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, as during the Great Depression, right now, this uh, experience is not confined to the United States. It's, it's international. And most of the news you see in the financial pages these days about Europe 
because they have plenty of problem of their own with their banking institutions and uh, with, with so-called sovereign debt, you know, the debt issued by European governments, uh, many of which you know, went into debt way beyond what they could reasonably expect to repay. So what do you know? They're not repaying it. They want the Germans to do it. <laughs> it's like, you know, let's not do it. Let's have the <coughs> And the Germans have been doing it because the Germans have big banks who, who have loans out to these guys and they want those loans to be repaid. So, so it's all coming back to the German taxpayers, basically, who are propping up the whole rotten system. Now the question is, how long would the long-suffering German taxpayers be patsies for the whole of Europe? <laughs> and I'm inclined to say not forever. <laughs> a day will come, and I don't think that day is too far in the future either, when they'll say, nine. <laughs> enough is enough. Uh, the stupidity, you know. They won't care whether the Greeks fall to the bottom of the Mediterranean and the Italians and the Spaniards along with them, because they'll get tired of being the responsible people taking the losses for the irresponsible people. That's just not the German way. Uh, so, anyhow. These international things complicate uh, these episodes tremendously. Uh, we, we had this Fed explosion of liquidity, the bailouts, the takeovers, the stimulus bills. I mentioned TARP, uh, which uh, provided $700 billion to first to take rotten securities <laughs> off the hands of financial firms, and then when they couldn't figure out how to value them, because the firms couldn't figure out how to value them either, uh, they threw up their hands before they ever got started and said, let's just invest in these banks, strengthen their balance sheets. So that's what they did, they went out, and the banks that didn't want this, the banks that said, look, we don't need this, we're strong enough already, our balance sheet's okay. Uh, they said, you got to take it anyhow, or we'll punish you. <laughs> they really did. They threatened bankers that they, they had to take th these government investments and you know, dilute their capital investment <laughs> with these government holdings. And if you've been following this, you'll see that they tried to pay back this stuff as fast as possible, and a bunch of them already have. Several hundred, actually, have repaid the TARP money including those that didn't want it in the first place. So, so now we've just got you know, pretty much the bad banks that are still partly owned by the federal government as a result of TARP. Uh, of course, right away in 2008, before the storm really quite struck, uh, Fannie Freddie and AIG went belly up and had to be nationalized, basically. The legalities of it are kind of complicated, but that's the bottom line of what happened. And, and, and later, of course, the, the big auto companies, GM and Chrysler, had to be taken over and then given back. And this was to bail out the auto workers union, uh, whose employees work for these companies and were strong supporters of the Obama administration. That's how politics works. You do something for me, I'll do something for you, and I'll do it with other people's money. So, these are some of the highlights of the current crisis compared. There are a lot of similarities again, you see, what happened in the, in the Great Depression. Uh, these are big events, even, even the one we're in now. It's gone on and on. Uh, it started way back at the beginning of 2008. Here we are in the middle of 2012. So there's been a lot of policies proposed, <coughs> policies put in place, policies altered, policies abandoned. Uh, there was even more of that during the Great Depression. A lot of come and go. Uh, in the Great Depression, uh, there were a tremendous number of crackpots and flakes that came running out to give their ideas to the government about what to do. 
And uh, uh, I hate to say it, but some of them were even flakier than the guys running the government. So uh, they were mostly sent away, but not all of them, not all of them. Some of them got their ideas put in place. Uh, the, the, uh, Professor Warren, who taught at Cornell, Ag Economics up there, he, he had, had been conducting statistical studies for decades. And he wrote a famous book, Warren and Pearson's book, called Prices. That's the title, Prices. And so they'd collected the history of prices in all kinds of products for you know, over a century. This book was published, I think, in 1930 or thereabouts. And, uh, and he had developed the idea. He would said, I've noticed, you know, I've noticed in my extensive study of prices that, that <clears throat> the only thing you really need to do to make all prices rise is raise the price of gold. When the price of gold goes up, these other prices go up. If the price of gold falls, other prices fall. <coughs> so if, if the Roosevelt administration will just uh, abandon the gold standard, and, and, and bid up the price of gold, it can raise prices across the board in the American economy, and we'll get out of this. You see, that's what all these, all these lobbyists are trying to do, you know, raise the price of wheat, raise the price of motor cars, you name it. So, so uh, Warren has this one-stop shopping. All you gotta do is raise the price of gold, and it solves all your problems. And what do you know? The government bought that. They said, okay, we'll do that. And so they abandoned the gold standard, uh, almost one of the first things they did when Roosevelt took office. And, uh, and they proceeded to start shortly thereafter uh, using the RFC to bid up the price of gold every day, you know. The uh, Secretary of the Treasury would come in, Roosevelt's in his bed, which is his habit in the morning. That's something he had in common with Keynes. You know, Keynes liked to lie in bed in the morning and make investments telephone calls and so forth, you know, order stocks, breakfast. And, uh, and Roosevelt would be in bed in the morning doing business there, and uh, Morgenthau would come in, you know, he'd say, Mr. President, you know, how high shall we make the price of gold today? And, you know, the president, in his wisdom, would yawn and say, um, yeah, let's, let's bring it up 13 cents today. Okay. And off they'd go to bid up the price of gold, uh, 13 cents. <laughs> and this went on. And Roosevelt picked things like, let's go up se seven cents today. And Morgenthau would say, well, why seven cents, Mr. President? And he said, it's a lucky number. <laughs> okay, I want you to think about this. What's going on here? These are the people trying to run the whole American economy. A guy, you know, sleepily telling some functionary that seven is a lucky number, so that's how you need to reprice one of the most important commodities in economic life. Crazy, crazy. And worse yet for them, it didn't work at all, of course. Uh, that didn't raise all the prices in the economy. They shouldn't have expected it to, certainly, after they went off the gold standard. So that, that's just an example of all the flakes that were running around then. It was, uh, it was raining, raining flakes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so they wanted to try something all the time, try something. They didn't know what to do. They were, they were at loose ends. Uh, but the president believed you shouldn't just do nothing simply because you don't know what to do. You should try something. Uh, he, he wrote a book and before he became president in which he announced this. It was in a speech he'd given you know, in his campaign. You know, I, I believe in taking an idea and trying it, and if it doesn't work, admit it and try something else. Okay? Not exactly in that accent, but <laughs> not being a patrician, I uh, cannot duplicate Roosevelt's accent. But at all events, he believed that way of going about business as long as he was president. Try something. Ignoramus, try something. And the guys who were advising him were not a hell of a lot smarter than he was about the economy either, I'm sorry to say. So they kept trying things. And along the way, to get political mileage and support for what they were doing, 
they would find scapegoats. And so from the very beginning, Roosevelt scapegoated to, uh, investors and people in financial markets, bankers. You know, try to blame them for the depression, blame them for the depression's persistence, blame them for any turnaround like the one in 1938, which is entirely produced by government policies, and so forth. Uh, and this actually got worse as time went on, because after 1935, Roosevelt, looking ahead to the election in 1936, was worried about all the flakes that were challenging him, like Huey Long from my state, you know? Love that guy, <laughs> Huey Long, he, with his Share the Wealth plan. Remember that? Share the Wealth. He, he, he got clubs started all over America, hundreds, maybe even thousands of them. Share the Wealth clubs, supporting Huey, who wanted to become president. This guy, this guy is from the backwoods of northern Louisiana, you know. In South Louisiana, we don't even speak to those people. <laughs> <laughs> They're just rednecks. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but Huey Long, you know, he becomes a really adept demagogue. He gets himself elected governor of the state of Louisiana. He proceeds to, you know, run him up there, uh, doing demagogic, populistic things pleasing people mightily by doing it, of course, and attacking Standard Oil to get the money, and taxing them to you know, get more money to support these projects he built, named after him, oddly enough. Uh, and, and, and then he starts to spread this out. He gets himself elected senator somehow. <laughs> I'll let you guess how he did that. Uh, and, uh, and he ends up haranguing the president all the time in the floor of the Senate in Washington. No respect whatsoever. And, and you'd think, okay, this guy's a nut. Ignore him. But the trouble was, he had millions of supporters all over the country, so Roosevelt couldn't ignore him. He wanted to be reelected in 1936. He had to somehow meet the competition. And Long wasn't the only one. Francis Townsend in California was promising to give everybody money if they would just spend it before the end of the month, every month. That's the Townsend plan. Simple. <laughs> I've actually heard people recently propose something similar to that. Like cash with an expiration date that you know the government would helicopter out to us and then we could spend it, you know, but only if we spend it, you know, in the next month or two weeks or whatever. Okay? So we wouldn't be hoarding money any, anymore and causing this recession to persist. We, we'd be out there spending like good little consumers. Uh, Townsend plan you know, strikes back from the grave. Uh, Father Coughlin in Detroit, the radio priest, you know, he had all these crazy plans for how to revive the economy. And uh, eventually the church reigned him in. I'm, I, I'm a little, actually, intimidated by lecturing here tonight. <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so. <laughs> I'm not a preacher, you know, or a priest. That's obvious. But anyhow, all these guys are making political waves, big ones. So Roosevelt's thinking about this, because that's what he thought about. That was the one thing he knew about. He was a master politician. Really, a master politician. And everything to him, everything, was a political question. He didn't think, is this good for the economy? Is this good for farmers in Iowa? Is, you know, is this good for beach bums in LA? Yeah. Is this politically a good move for me? And so that's how he approved or disapproved of things. And so he decided, really starting in 34, but coming on very strong in 35, that he would change direction. And he would move away from his early stance, which was sort of to try to give everybody what they wanted, including business interests. He had this National Industrial Recovery Act with all these industrial cartels. Something business wanted. They wanted that, so he gave it to them. Well, at 35 on, he just unambiguously went after businessmen investors full out, just attack them, uh, demonize them, call them names, threaten them with various punitive actions, uh, did everything he could to, to present himself as even more populistic than guys like Huey Long. 
Huey conveniently, actually, before the election came along, got himself shot to death on the steps of the Capitol in Baton Rouge. You can still go there and see some of the marks where bullets hit the pillars, if that's your cup of tea. But uh, Huey disappeared, but there were still a lot of radical challengers out there. So Roosevelt was meeting them head on with radicalism of his own. And what we got out of that was another one of these huge sessions where Congress passed all kinds of amazing legislation, particularly the Social Security Act, the National Labor Relations Act, the Public Utilities Holding Act, the Banking Act of 1935, and a bunch of others. And the effect of this was to greatly expand national power in places it had never been before, to centralize power, including monetary power uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, and generally to expand the size, scope, and power of the national government in all directions. And the people loved it. And he won the 1936 election by a landslide, and he took that to heart. In fact, he took it too much to heart, because that's when he made his greatest political miscalculation. He decided that he could do no wrong, and so he went on the, continued to go on the warpath about business, but he also decided that the Supreme Court, which had been overturning some of these early acts, including the, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which it struck down in 1935, and the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which it struck down in 1936, these were the, the big pieces of the early New Deal. And the court had knocked them down. Roosevelt says, I'll get these bastards. So he came up without really talking to anybody to speak of, maybe two or three people, with his court packing plan, which he just kind of announced out of the blue in 1937 without floating any trial balloons or anything. He says, I'm going to you know, uh, introduce a plan here to reorganize the court by, by you know, uh, making life easier for the justices. A lot of these guys are old, you know, it must be hard for them to keep up with their caseloads. So for everyone that's over 70 years of age, uh, one new justice will be appointed by him, of course. Uh, so that way he could take all these old mossbacks that were voting against New Deal legislation and, and get rid of them, in effect, by canceling them with one of his guys he appointed to the court. Well. A lot of people had a serious negative reaction to that. They said, that, that's too much. You know, you look as if you're trying to take over here and be a dictator like Mussolini or Hitler. We're not that kind of country. Even Democrats said, that's not right. You, know, you, you can't do that. You can't just go in there and treat the Supreme Court like they were naughty children. They're, they're a revered institution. They're part of our structure of government. So pe people violently reacted against that, and he had almost no support for it, even though he tried to use his political power to punish people who opposed him. It didn't work. They opposed him anyhow. Martin? Okay, well, let me, let me try to wrap this up quickly then. I, I could keep you here all night because I'm having so much fun. Uh, but, keep going. Uh, this, all this radical activity in the late 30s generated what I, I call regime uncertainty because it created fear in the minds of investors that Roosevelt was going to become a dictator, that his country was going to be turned into some kind of fascist or socialist economy, uh, that private property rights were going to just be obliterated uh, the way they had, in effect, already been in Germany and, and Italy and certainly in Russia. Uh, and, and the whole system was seen as up for grabs. I mean, we look back on this and we think, oh, no, nah, that's hyperbole. But it's not. I've adduced mountains of evidence. And next to my mountains of evidence are huge mountains, even bigger ones, that Gary Dean Best put into a book called Pride, uh, Politics, and what's the last word of the title? Anyhow, I've forgotten the exact title now, Best Book, but it's, it's, it's like 300, 400 pages of just one piece of evidence after another of how frightened investors were of Roosevelt's actions uh, from 1935 onward. And the, the result is, one of the results was that long-term investment never 
revived much at all. And if you look at investment of any kind, short-term, long-term, inventory, you name it, total investment, private investment for the whole 11 years, 1930 through 1940, add it all up, it's negative. That is to say, depreciation allowances were more than all the money spent for new plant and equipment in an 11-year span. Nothing like that ever happened in our economic history, ever. Not before, not since. And you can't have a growing economy if the capital stock doesn't get built up. That's what makes labor more productive for the most part. Even if technology is improved, it usually has to be implemented in the form of some new technology, I mean some new capital equipment in which that knowledge is embedded. So if you stymie all additions of capital stock for 11 years, of course you're going to have a sick economy. That's what we had for more than a decade there. We never got close to recovering uh, because if you remember that complicated graph I showed you, the trend lines in there were the lines that you would have followed if you had steady growth from 1929 to 1948, the business cycle peaks. So that, that's how you could have got there, but we were always well below, even in 1941, when some economists want to tell you we'd recovered. We hadn't recovered, we just got back to where we started this hill in 1929. The economy should have grown a great deal in that decade. Didn't grow at all, just got back to where it was. That's not recovery in an economy that normally has 25, 30% addition to its capital stock in a decade. Right? So this, is a, this, this was the upshot of Roosevelt's politicking, and not just his. He had lots of aides and uh, supporters and advisors and what have you who were on the same wavelength. These people who, who hated business, who believed that government could run the show better than capitalists, and he thought people like them were the ones to do it. So, you know, the Frankfurters, James Landis, William O. Douglas, the list just goes on and on of these guys that were once called the boys with their hair on fire. Uh, the Brandeis Frankfurter faction of New Dealers who, who despised everything but little business. They pretended to like little business, but everything else they they hated and wanted the government to regulate or take over. And uh, that's what created the fright, suppressed the investment, and kept the economy in the depression. Now, what we've seen lately, uh, I think, is similar. That is, I think the uh, actions of the government from 2008 to the present have certainly increased the apprehension that investors feel about the security of their property rights. <laughs> A whole variety of ways. You know, they're afraid taxes will be raised, or you know, they're afraid that the regulations that have been created will will end up costing them so much their profits will fall or disappear, and so forth. So we've got a kind of regime uncertainty now. I would distinguish it though, because uh, in the late 30s, uh, the system was really viewed as up for grabs. You know, serious people thought. Five years from now, this could be a fascist economy, just like Italy. Serious people thought that and were afraid of it. Uh, I, I don't think now we have that kind of threat, partly because we already have a fascist economy. <laughs> we just don't call it that. It's not up for grabs anymore. It's pretty strong. It's well in place. It has countless thousands of supporters and, and interested parties. Uh, define it. It's a, si a system in which the government makes all the ultimate decisions about uh, how resources will be allocated, uh, who will get income, who will not, who will have to have to uh, bear the costs of all kinds of policies that wouldn't be taken but for government order and so forth. I mean, the government, you can't do anything in the world we live in if the government doesn't want you to do it. They already have something in place to prevent you. I guarantee it. <laughs> and uh, you may think, well, I'm, I'm doing nothing wrong. I'm obeying all the laws. It doesn't matter. IRS could storm into your business any time of the day or night and, and find you in violation of any number of regulations they want. And you'll lose in court, almost certainly. 
if you have the audacity to go to court, but they'll probably strip you of your property in the process so you never have the means to go to court. They do that quite frequently too. So our economy's not up, up for grabs, it's already been grabbed. Uh, and, and now we're just kind of fighting over the bits and pieces. We're fighting over what goes on in the interstices of an economy where some room for maneuver remains. It's still possible to get rich in this economy, obviously. People do it all the time. Okay? But you can't do it in the old-fashioned way. you got to work in some way that allows you to escape some of these burdens and barriers. And say, like, for a while, companies like Microsoft did it. They didn't even have a lobbyist in Washington. They said, we're not interested in politics. Hell with that. Well, the government showed them, you damn well better take an interest or we'll ruin you. We'll get antitrust uh, and prosecutors all over you and break you to pieces. And so now Microsoft has a giant office in D.C. loaded with lawyers and lobbyists, just like all the other companies. Okay? The government showed them who runs this country. And it's not companies. It's the government. Okay? So we've had a, a kind of similar situation here and, uh, lately. And uh, that's why I fade to black here. Ha, 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 ha.